Can I use the mic? Can I use, can I use the mic? Okay, okay. Hey, uh, my name is Lalu Oshidoku, and I work with uh, the Lightning guys. And you know me as maybe Roast Beef on the internet, on GitHub, Twitter, everything else. I've been Roast Beef for the past eight years, and I'm still Roast Beef. That's how it works. And I'm going to give you a deep dive into the Lightning network. Uh, you know, I remember like maybe like two years ago when I myself was learning about Bitcoin initially, and I went to these you know Bitcoin meetups, the Dev meetups at 20th Mission, and there's also like you know it was a deep uh, deep dive, and Tarek was was like the MC there, like super funny guy. So I'm like happy to be able to like you know give back to the community now with my own talk, and you know it's full circle at this point. All right, uh, just a quick outline of the talk. First, I'll kind of like give like a high level overview of the Lightning network. I won't be kind of like you know going Lightning 101 because this is kind of like meant to be like a deep dive talk, kind of like more into the uh, you know the core and fittings of the technology. Then I'll be going over some updates we've made to kind of like our scripts and the re revocation um, uh, protocol within it. And then I'll be going over something I call L LCP, or the Lightning Commitment Protocol, which is kind of like exactly how two nodes in the Lightning Network update the commitment, per uh, commitment transaction. And you basically have like HTLCs flying, you know, back and forth, and everything's like, you know, super fast and stuff. And then I'll also talk about writing for a little bit, you know, which is kind of like a hot topic. And we, uh, I recently collaborated with Bitfury on a paper where we you know, presented a, a possible solution to routing. And I'll talk about you know, that paper in detail a bit. And then also kind of like what we may be doing initially is kind of like a stopgap before we start to like do some more advanced stuff. All right, so lightning from 10,000 feet, you know, bi-directional channels. Uh, so like, you know, this is the regular payment channel, you kind of have like a two of two multi-sig escrow, right? Where Alice and Bob get together, they put you know, one Bitcoin each, or maybe like you know, Bob has one, Alice has zero, and they put that into escrow itself. And uh, in order to do this protocol safely, because we have nested transactions with the funding transaction and the equipment transaction, we requ require some sort of like malleability fix. And the one we currently use within our software is uh, SegWit or SegGreater Witness. And basically, if you don't have this malleability fix, you can kind of went, uh, you know, run into some, some odd areas where maybe like Bob, you know, malleates the transaction and Alice's funds are stuck. And then Bob kind of does some like random thing and basically says, okay, like if you want your money, you know, give me a little bit more. And, uh, you know, with a malleability fix, we can, we can avoid that. And then, you know, another thing is with CLTV and CSV, and, uh, you know, CLTV meaning, meaning uh, an absolute timeout, and CSV is like a relative time, time lock itself. Using these two together, we can basically have channel to have an unbounded lifetime, meaning they never need to close, right? So we open a channel, and we can leave it open, you know, for a year or two, you know, at the best case if we really want to. Otherwise, you know, maybe we have like a CLTV timeout, which means like we have a channel open for one or two days, and then we have to close it out, and then that, that's, uh, you know, uh, that's the extent of the channel. But you know, using this new design, we can basically have channels open uh, indefinitely. And uh, you know, so balance updates themselves are basically like a two-party like iterated protocol, where uh, we you know try to do all the updates in an atomic manner for the most part. Where I push Alice money, and you know she accepts this new state and then revokes the old state. It's important that Alice revokes the prior state because otherwise, you know, Alice can go back to the state where she has the most money. And in order to to do that revocation, we basically rip up all the prior states in itself such that if Alice tries to broadcast this prior state, then I can punish her essentially, right? And the way I punish Alice is I use the, uh, you know, the Bitcoin blockchain itself as what I call, I mean, well, there's a paper by Macaulay. It's called an invisible trusted third party. And uh, you can say, oh yeah, TTPs are bad, right? Uh, you know, we want to avoid that in Bitcoin, right? But you can view you know, the Bitcoin blockchain as an invisible trusted third party, meaning that it actually only steps in when it's needed, right? If Alice tries to cheat me and broadcast you know, state one and worry state two, I go to the Bitcoin blockchain, you know, this invisible third party, and it acts as the judge, right? And uh, with this acting like the judge, the judge basically enforces fairness for us, and then the judge also adds kind of a clause within this fairness uh, protocol, which uh, allows either side, uh, you know, some sort of period where they can attest, you know, to the current balance. So, you know, if I'm Bob and I want to be like sneaky, and we're at like state five, and I try to broadcast state two, you know, I can't immediately sweep all the money. I may have to wait like some sort of delay period, maybe it's like a day or two, maybe it's a week. And this delay period allows Alice to basically come, uh, you know, to present uh, to the judge, the, the blockchain itself, a better proof of the current state of the channel. And because every single time we step forward, I revoke a prior state, if I ever go backwards, then Alice or, or Bob or, you know, whoever is my counterparty can then present this proof to the judge that shows that I, you know, violated the contract and Alice can move forward and actually uh, continue the balance. And she gets all the money, essentially. So it's kind of, uh, you know, this uh, scenario where uh, both sides always move forward, and if you ever try to move backwards, you basically get punished and you lose all your money. And then, uh, you know, so that's how we actually handle the uh, bi-directional payment channel aspect, which allows both sides to send money back and forward. But, you know, one of the main things was the concept of the HTLC, right, the uh, hash time lock contract. And what HTLC says is basically, you know, I'll pay you two Bitcoin, uh, you know, insert, you know, whatever the denomination there, uh, if you can open this commitment within one day. 
And uh, you know, if we're just doing like a single hop, then you know Bob has the uh, commitment, which basically, I mean, he can open the commitment, which means he has pre-image to that commitment, and it gets opened, and then I pay out to Bob, right? So this is basically like a time lock uh, commitment scheme. And you know, previously, the way people tried to solve this before is they assumed the existence of what they call like time lock encryption, where Alice would basically you know have the pre-image and encrypt it in such a way that Bob, you know, if he's like grinding, you know, on all four cores, uh, you know, for like two days, can actually decrypt that commitment and then uh, you know can uh, get his money back. But with Bitcoin, we have cool things like you know time-based opcodes, and with those opcodes, we can actually just use that directly in the system. We don't need we don't need to re rely on some kind of like dubious time lock encryption that may not actually exist at all. And uh, you know, so if we just do uh, a one hop, that's cool. But you know, we can do uh, you know multiple hops across the network. And when we do multiple hops across the network, we use these HTLCs in a chain manner, where every single hop decrements the time lock. And as you decrement the time lock, that gives each party you know a window of uh, opportunity in which once they get the pre-image, they can then settle all the way backwards. So initially, we clear the HTLCs, meaning that everyone updates the balances. You know, everyone has like one Bitcoin less all the way to Charlie. And at that point, Charlie settles the HTLC by actually revealing his pre-image, and that gets routed all the way back to Alice. Everyone pulls the money, and everything's fine. And you know, we can do this uh, with you know arbitrary path lengths, essentially. Uh, obviously, if you have uh, a longer path length, maybe there's um, some issues with like like the time value of money. How long do I want my money locked up? And you know, how many fees do I pay? But um, you know, using this, you can have end-to-end uh, like -end security with HTLCs, meaning that uh, you know Bob can't get paid before you know Charlie gets paid, and so on. And that's how uh, you know, we do these chain commitments. I actually have the network part of the Lightning Network. And uh, you know, just a little bit of thing about uh, commitment schemes. Uh, you know, for Lightning itself, we require uh, secure commitment schemes, right? And a secure commitment scheme has basically two traits. Uh, the first one is called uh, hiding, and the next one is called binding. And what hiding means is that you know, giving two commitments, you can't tell exactly what was committed to. And if you guys are familiar with like randomized encryption, like uh, you know, counter mode and AES, or like uh, the INDCPA uh, security definition, this is the exact same thing. So basically, you know, me extending the commitment towards Bob, Bob should have no idea exactly what was committed to. Because if he knew what, he, what it was committed to, he could basically just take that money, and Alice never gets the money it's herself, right? And the next one is we want binding, meaning that uh, you know, once you actually uh, commit to a certain value, you shouldn't be able to open that um, commitment with two distinct values. And you know, if you could do that, you could basically have a collision on the hash function that we use. And if you can collide, then uh, you, know, you can present to me multiple input values, and I can like, basically be, uh, I can pull the money twice, or you can pull the money twice. And, and currently in the scheme, we use uh, SHA-256, and you can use any other uh, commitment scheme that uh, satisfies these two properties of hiding and binding. And uh, if you assume like a random oracle, which means you assume that a hash function gives you like a perfectly random value every single time, you can use that to construct the scheme. And it's perfectly hiding and computationally binding, meaning you, know, you can do collisions if you can you know, do like you know, one to, to the 128 work or so, but uh, we assume that's computationally feasible. All right, and um, so one thing I mentioned before is the revocation scheme, right? So for every single state you move forward, you need to provide me a revocation of that prior state. Meaning if, if you ever go back to you know, state, uh, take state one and we're on state two, I can take all your money. But you know, as you can see, this kind of grows linearly, right? Where if we're doing like a billion updates, I have to store like a billion uh, you know, values essentially. And that uh, can be limiting because I need uh, a lot of storage actually to do this. So the way we solve this, we solve this with a compact revocation scheme. And you know, the goals here is that the client, uh, I'm sorry, the, the sender, meaning the person that's actually doing the updates, should only have to store a constant amount of information. That information is essentially like the root of a special tree and the current update counter. And then yet the uh, receiver just only stores log n. So you know, if we're doing like a million updates, it only stores 20, super efficient, right? And um, the way we do this, we use something I, I call like an authentic, authenticated PRF, meaning a pseudorandom function, yet when you give me all the outputs of the PRF, I can be sure that it came from the PRF that you've created with a particular seed. So every single, uh, you know, every single output I get, I'm like, okay, I checked the proof, and this is a correct output, and we can keep moving forward. And the way we do this is something uh, we call Elkrum. And it's basically like a re reverse uh, uh, Merkle tree, right? So you know, typically in a Merkle tree, you have the leaves at the bottom, and you hash all the leaves upwards, right? And then finally, you have the root, and uh, you know, I can prove to you that any of the leaves are part of this tree in, in, in log n space, right? But instead, we go the other direction. We start with the root. Uh, you know, uh, Alice has a certain secret and a hash, you know, a, a key derivation function. In the current code, we use the hash key derivation function, or sorry, hmac uh, key derivation function. And the way you do this, it's a recursive structure, right? So you have the root at the top, and when, if you want to go down to the left node, you hash the root and zero, right? And then if I want to go down to the right node, I hash the root and one. So if we're saying the tree is of height two, 
Then I basically hash it twice, and now I give you that, uh, that first node. And then as we continue, I give you the second node, I give you the third node, you can check the proof, and now you can basically only store the third node, and you can derive the first or the second, you know, based on this commitment scheme, I mean, based on the hashing scheme itself. And, uh, you know, when these are maintained, both for the sender and the receiver, so the sender is, you know, sending out values, the receiver uh, gets uh, the hash value, checks it is properly in the tree, if it can truncate its storage, because it now has a parent node of some leaves, and it can truncate that, and we keep going. So now with this, if you know, I go back and I broadcast, I broadcast state 9,000, you can get state 9,000 uh, basically in like login hashes, right? Because you have uh, you know, one of the intermediate nodes and you hash it left and right, and then finally you have the proper node and you broadcast that out, you take my money, and everything's fine. And then additionally, um, one, another update we've made is in the revocation scheme itself. So like initially the revocation scheme kind of used like a chain uh, BIP32 hierarchy. And then it kind of like went to uh, like hash-based uh, revocations. Uh, I think it was proposed by uh, like Adam, Back, and Rusty. But now we're kind of combining, combining those two and we're using revocation keys themselves, right? So revocation keys, uh, it's kind of like an optimization. We, we realize that in the script, this allows us to uh, you know, compress the script sig, meaning what we use to redeem the script itself, and also the, the, uh, the uh, length of the, of the output script. And then we can also save like an extra uh, hash invocation, essentially, right? So rather than uh, Bob presenting like a secret pre-image value in order to uh, do revocation, Bob presents a key, right? And this key is derived in a certain way such that I can give Bob a key and he can be sure that if I give him a secret value, then he can get the private key to that corresponding public key, right? So instead we now use revocation keys. So uh, if we're looking at this, uh, if we say C is Bob's commitment key and P is like my pre-image for that particular state, for Bob to create this next state, I give him this revocation key what I do is I add his point, uh, uh, you know, his public key to the channel, and then I add, uh, I, I create a point with the pre-image, and then I add that together um, with, the, with Bob's point, right? And uh, what Bob gets is Bob gets the revocation key, and he uses that and everything's fine. But when I go to the next state, what I do is I give him this P value, right? And once he has P, he can actually derive the private key which corresponds to the revocation key. And this kind of like uses a trick in, uh, you know, elliptic curves, basically, uh, the addition operation is commutative. So we can see initially like, you know, C plus G times P goes down to C, uh, G times little c, which is Bob's private key. And then because you can then, uh, you know, read, undistribute uh, the math there, you get G times C plus P, and which is some R value. So now when I give Bob the pre-image, all Bob does is, you know, he takes his regular private key for his commitment key, take the pre-image, adds it together, and then he gets the revocation key. And as you can see, you know, it uh, simplifies down to the, the exact same solution. And with this, we get a little more compact scripts and everything's uh, slightly more efficient. And uh, if you're familiar with like pay to contract hash, this is what they use where basically like you can say that a merchant wants to buy something, they have an initial hash and use this to drive a payment address for the merchant. And you can say in court, oh, the merchant you know, knew about our contract because they can derive the private key if they didn't have the, um, uh, the contract itself. And it's also used in like, um, uh, like vanity address generation where you can give you know, a vanity address generator like a single key and they can just add points together. Because you know, point addition is much faster than like elliptic curve uh, scalar multiplication. And you can also do like a, a trick called double scalar multiplication to like speed that up, where you basically calculate G times C at plus G times P in a single step, rather than to do it individually. And that's like another optimization you can uh, exploit there. All right, so the next thing we're going over now is called the Lightning Commitment Protocol. And so like what this is essentially, the Lightning Commitment Protocol is the like link layer protocol between two nodes itself. And you know, this is the protocol that the nodes use to actually update the commitment transaction in an efficient manner. So you know, we have like HTLCs flinging across. We're, we're sending HTLCs and they get locked into the commitment transaction and then eventually uh, Bob settles the commitment transaction. And you know, uh, right off the bat, we wanna make this extremely fast, right? Because if you make the link layer protocol you know, optimize and uh, uh, such that you optimize throughput, then the network as a whole in aggregate, if all the links are optimized, the network itself will be, um, will be optimized as a whole in terms of the total throughput of the network. And you know, we have a few goals that we set out when we're designing this protocol. One thing is we wanna batch updates, right? If I have like, you know, 10 HTLCs I wanna send, I don't wanna wait you know, for like 10 different updates, right? I wanna say I'm putting all 10 of these HTLCs onto the transaction at once, you act those changes and we move forward, right? Another thing is I want to be able to pipeline new changes. In, you know, a scenario where we have basically very high throughput bidirectionally, I want to be able to queue up new changes before you even get back to me. Because otherwise, you know, I have to stop and wait. And if I'm waiting, I could be forward HDLCs, I could be making more money, we could be, you know, helping out the network better. And another thing is we want to desynchronize updates. Meaning that, you know, Alice and Bob being connected to each other, we don't want to like, uh, you know, only have Alice do an update, only have Bob do an update, right? 
Because if you imagine a network that's you know, uh, well connected and there's updates going in both directions, they need to be able to basically create updates independent of one, each, one another. And you know, if you can add the desynchronization, then for the most part you can eliminate blocking. And if you eliminate blocking and you're desynchronized and you can allow batch and pipeline uh, updates, you basically have very, very high bi-directional throughput. And uh, you know, LC LCP in a nutshell is basically uh, kind of like a thought model I'm using right now. I think of like Lightning as basically like shadow chains, meaning they're kind of like blockchains, right? Where uh, with Lightning, uh, you know, there's like asymmetric state, meaning I have a commune transaction and you have a commune transaction, right? And then uh, you can imagine I can add updates to the, to the state, and that's basically like the mempool, right? So like I'm adding, okay, add this HTLC, add this one to this one, and that's in the mempool. And then when, when I actually want to commit to the, uh, you know, extend the chain one to move to a new state, I reference the mempool. I say, okay, you know, get those five HTLCs I added, and this is the new state itself, right? So this allows me to basically keep adding uh, new changes in, in, in a desynchronized manner. And uh, we have something else we call like the revocation window. And what the revocation window is, it's kind of like, like a sliding window in TCP, right? Where I can keep you know, adding new updates until I exhaust your window. And this lets me basically, uh, you know, in a desynchronized manner, add new updates before you even reply to me. And if I get to the end, the end of the window, you know, I wait and you act those changes and then I can, I can continue forward. And you know, there's like a timer there and maybe I can also like batch these updates in once. And uh, the revocation window also kind of acts as flow control where if I'm you know, doing updates faster than you, you can actually keep up, I stop for a second, you know, I wait, I let you act those new things, and we can move forward. Uh, you know, in the current protocol, the replication window is like fixed. It's maybe like four or 16, but you can imagine maybe we can do you know, more advanced things where like, okay, I'm moving faster, so I, you can like let me extend the replication window by two, and maybe we can shrink it, and so on. But we, we keep it simple for now. All right, so I have a quick demo. I mean, not a demo, sorry, a diagram to kind of show the way uh, the protocol works itself, right? So uh, at the top of the screen, we have Bob's you know, like commitment chain, where he's only at state zero. And at the bottom, we have Alice's chain. And in the middle, we have like this shared log, right? And the log is, you can treat it as a mempool. And the log is, for the most part, it's append only. And it, it can be compacted once we know that those entries are no longer, no longer needed. And uh, in this example, we have a revocation window of size two meaning Bob can create two new updates without, Alec act, without Alice acting those updates, essentially, right? So initially, uh, you know, Alice is adding some HTLCs. She has another one and another one. So now we have three HTLCs you know, in the log, right? And they're uncommitted yet. So it means, this means that both sides basically have this in their log, but they haven't, yet reflect, they haven't yet updated the new state to reflect the HTLCs itself. So now what Alice does is Alice creates a new um, chain in the commitment, right? So Alice creates a new update. And when, when Alice sends over the update, she sends over a signature, right? But then she also sends over a log index, which indexes into Alice's log and says, you know, this commitment signature includes every single HTLC or every single update, you know, below this log index, right? And what this, this lets Bob say, okay, I have your index. I, it then, uh, Bob then constructs the proper view, and a view is essentially like, you know, a commitment transaction with the proper HTLCs, and the balance is re reflected as so. So because we have, you know, add A1, A2, A0, Alice then gets uh, her balance decremented by that amount for each of the HTLCs, and we have three pending HTLCs on this, um, on Bob's commit transaction, right? So at this point, Bob has the new update, right? Because Alice signed the update to Bob, Bob can broadcast if, if, if he wants to, you know, and that everything's okay. But what Bob does now is Bob revokes the prior state, boom, and that basically, you know, he says, okay, I like state one, I don't need state zero. When Bob revokes the prior state, Bob sends over the pre-image for that prior state to Alice. And you'll also notice that when Alice sent over uh, that new commitment update, Alice consumed one of Bob's revocation, uh, you know, one item from Bob's revocation window. So boom, you know, a revocation window decremented by one. Bob has this new uh, state. Bob revokes the prior state. And when Bob revokes the prior state, he also adds on to the end of the revocation window. So now Alice can, you know, now do two more updates without Bob responding in a desynchronized manner. So now uh, Alice has Bob's revocation house revocation hash, and now at this point, uh, Bob sends over to Alice, okay, I like that update, here's your version, and then again, Alice revokes it, and then Bob gets this new revocation hash, right? So what we did here is like, Bob basically, you know, pipelined or batched three updates. He added three HTLCs at once in a single commitment transaction, rather than basically doing three individual updates. So with this, you can basically, you know, batch updates and get very, very high throughput up to a certain amount. Uh, you know, one thing you have to be careful about in, ter in terms of batching, is you need to ensure that the, transac the transaction can actually get onto the blockchain. And, you know, because you can create something that has maybe like 10,000 outputs, right? And that's going to basically violate the, the cost or the weight limit in terms of the maximum size of the transaction. 
But if you stay below that, you can basically keep batching these updates and then do it a single one. So now, you know, uh, Alice has these three HTLCs, and Alice is going to send these HTLCs to Bob. So now Bob's turn, right? Let's say Bob, uh, after some period of time, Bob gets the pre-images. Once Bob gets the pre-images, Bob can settle all three HTLCs in a single uh, transaction, right? So what Bob does is, you know, oh, I thought that was animated, but it's not. Uh, 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 Bob sends three settle messages and adds them to the log, and that basically settles, you know, A0, A1, and A2. And then Bob also adds two HTLCs of his own, you know, going in the other direction. So with a single update, you know, there's a brand new set of HTLCs in the commit transaction. We didn't need to wait and, you know, do six or, you know, three updates. Bob says, okay, settling all of those and then adding my, own, my, adding my own HTLCs. And then at that point, Bob can now create a new update for Alice. And, you know, Alice's update references, you know, everything that Alice has done, which are, you know, her HTLCs. And then it also references Bob's HTLCs, meaning Bob settles and then the new HTLCs that he adds himself. And then at this point, Bob, uh, Alice now says, you know, I like that um, state update, revokes your prior state, and Bob now gets a new uh, revocation hash from Alice. So at this point, if Alice tries to broadcast A0 or A1, Bob has the pre-image, and then Bob can punish, can punish Alice. So at this point, um, Alice then replies back to Bob, gives him a room transaction, which references again into this shared log, and then Bob's like, okay, I like that too, and then that's done itself. So, you know, this illustrates the concept of LCP, where basically both sides are completely synchronized. You can batch and pipeline updates within a certain verification window, and for the most part, things are non-blocking. If at some point Bob is moving too fast for Alice, and, you know, Bob you know, keeps extending new uh, HDLCs and new commitment updates, Bob stops for a second, there's a, there's a timer wait-out period, and then eventually Alice acts on the old changes, and Bob can continue and move forward. All right, now to uh, LND. So LND is the Lightning Network Daemon. Uh, the name might change, but this is what we're calling it for now. Um, the language of choice is Go. If you guys don't know Go, it's a systems language, you know, created by Google in about like 08, 09 or so. Initially, it was, wasn't very popular, but now it's getting more and more ground. It was created by the guys who initially worked on, you know, Plan 9 and C, and they kind of had a few principles in mind. One thing is Go is very, very simple. Like, the syntax is extremely simple. It doesn't have a lot of, like, line noise like Rust or C++ or anything like that. Uh, there's also kind of, like, a de facto formatting in the language. So it's very easy to work in like large code base because everyone else's code just looks the same. You know, the styles enforced by this particular tool. Uh, Go also has like first class concurrency support. Uh, it has these like lightweight threads and also primitives to do message passing between the threads. And that comes in handy, you know, in several places in LND because we want this to be as concurrent as possible. We want to basically optimize the daemon itself such that it can handle like uh, separate HTLCs at once. And it also has a pretty expensive standard library, meaning a lot of things like, uh, you know, TLS or like, um, uh, some certain cryptographic operations are all in the standard library, and you also get like a single statically linked binary, which is very easy to cross compile between you know various operating systems. And uh, we use a particular Bitcoin library called BTC Suite. Uh, these are the guys who like make BTCD. You guys heard of BTCD? It's another uh, alternative node implementation, which uh, I contribute to myself. And you know I think it's a great library. It has like very good documentation, very good testing. I actually think it's a pretty good resource for, you know, for newcomers to come and learn to Bitcoin, right? Because you can basically just jump right into the code. The code is pretty well documented, it's pretty well commented, and for the most part, they're you know, very helpful. You can jump on IRC, we'll help you out. And we use a series of libraries from these guys, uh, I mean, from this uh, uh, GitHub repo itself, and that includes things like handling like scripts, uh, you know, creating transactions, validating transactions, doing things with uh, BIP32, the HD keychain, uh, some blue filter stuff for your SVV nodes, and so on. And then the daemon also has a, an RPC server. And uh, initially we have two versions. Or I see only one is implemented right now, but in the final version you'll be able to pick between two RPC servers. And the first one is uh, HTTP REST. You know, as you guys know, it's um, you know, HTTP based. You do get and post and various other verbs, and you can basically use that in terms of like a JavaScript library or via like a regular command line in JSON. Or we can also have an option for a gRPC. And what gRPC is based on Protobuf, right? If you guys know Protobuf, it's a message serialization layer created by Google, and it basically lets you have this kind of like declarative language where you declare it in a file, this is my message, these are the fields, and you can compile that to any language, right? Once you compile that to a language, you basically get free serialization. And the serialization is optimized to a degree, it handles things like variable length integers, and tries to keep things compact for the most part. But gRPC is an extension of that. Where in the same configuration file, or this declarative file, you can then define uh, an RPC service, right? And the RPC service says, okay, this is foo. Foo takes the message bar and then returns pass. And then you compile that. And that generates like an entire server view and then also client binding for that server. And the cool thing about gRPC, it's based on HTTP2, uh, which is kind of like, you know, the next generation of HTTP2, I mean, next generation of HTTP, which actually adds things like binary serialization, flow control, multiplexing, and, and so on. 
And the cool fact is that uh, HTTP2 was actually created, or I mean, for the most part, uh, the main co-author was Mike Belshi of BitGo. Uh, you know, fun fact for you guys. And another cool thing about uh, gRPC, it supports bi-directional streaming RPCs, meaning that we can have like a stream between a client and server, and the server and client can communicate bi-directionally without having to create a new you know, TCP connection and so forth for every single, um, uh, every single request itself. And then this is the architecture of the data. So uh, the, things, the two things in italics, the wallet controller and the chain notifier are actually interfaces. And the wallet controller is basically like a bare bones interface for kind of like a basic Bitcoin wallet, right? This wallet doesn't understand lightning or anything yet, but it, it can basically just you know, uh, give, a give us outputs, give us keys, and then do the basic things for that, right? And then around that we have the Ellen wallet. And the Ellen wallet is the version of the wallet which encapsulates the wallet controller and interface. And that can actually drive the daemon because it knows what channels are, knows how to do planning and so forth. And then we have something called uh, you know, like the funding reservations within, the, within the, uh, the wallet. And what this does, it allows the wallet to basically uh, handle concurrent funding reservations, right? Because you can imagine there's like a race condition where like, oh, this guy wants you know, this one BTC output, right? So then, that needs to be locked up for the duration of that funding. Because otherwise, you have like a double spend. If you have you know, two funding transactions that represent the same output, and the, fund res the funding reservation helps to um, uh, you know, make sure that doesn't happen. And then we have the chain notifier. So you know, with Lightning, it's very important, uh, you know, uh, depending on your contract, depending on the time locks, that you watch the blockchain, right? So the chain notify kind of abstracts that away, and this is also an interface. And this is responsible for things like you know, letting me know when a new block comes in, letting me know when something's been spent, you know, let me know when I have four you know, confirmations in my funding transaction, and this is also abstracted away. Uh, you know, so you can implement this with things like an API, you know, Bitcoin D, BTCD, and so forth. And then also with the wallet controller itself, we have some default implementations of the daemon, which include uh, BTC Wallet, which is a wallet uh, kind of created by the same guys as BTCD. And we're also working on some SPV support. So you can drop that right in and any, any other wallet, and it should just work perfectly. And then you know, continuing there, we have the funding manager. And the funding manager kind of bridges the wallet's reservation protocol and the P2P protocol itself. So you know, these were designed to be relatively decoupled, meaning we can take the same wallet and use it in some other application, independent of what we designed for our P2P protocol. And then uh, we have the uh, BoltDB. Uh, BoltDB is a pure Go embedded database. It's a, it's a pretty uh, simple key value store. But this is what we use currently to store things like uh, you know, the state of the channel, what my current identification is, things like the routing table, and, and so on. And next we have the network router. The network router communicates directly with the server. And this is kind of, you know, this uh, incorporates what it learned from the network in terms of the current graph. So the network router knows about all the channels currently open on the network. It knows about uh, you know, what my current like, neighborhood size is. And then uh, you know, that handles, handles like the layer three routing. So once a user wants to send a payment, it goes to the network router and then goes to the HTLC switch, which is connected to all the peers. And the switch is just concerned with helping multi-hop forwarding. So you know, it, it treats all the peers and open channels as interfaces. When a payment comes in, it knows who to send it to next and then forwards it on the correct interface. And then finally, we have the RPC server, which lets the user uh, you know, control and drive all of those aspects. And I guess I'm going to do a demo now. So the server I have right now, I have uh, two VPSs right now. Uh, one is in New York. The other one is in um, San Francisco. And actually, with the demo now, we have a bit of uh, real latency. So we can actually see some real world scenarios here. Uh, on the top right screen here, I have a BTCD node running in SimNet mode, and you know with SimNet basically I can create blocks instantaneously, and I don't have to wait for uh, you know a block to come every 10, 20 minutes or so, like it would be on testnet. So um, here's the node right here. Do a get info, and everything's fine. All right, so I'm going to start up the two LND nodes. Here's the first one. Comes up. And then also here's the second one here. So both nodes are up. They're currently connected to BTCD. Um, so right now for to control LND, we have a CLI called BTC, I mean called uh, LNCLI. This is similar to Bitcoin CLI or BTT, BTC CTL. And basically, you know, this lets us do RP, various RPC commands. Uh, so first one, uh, we have a get info, and that's like the lighting ID and the identity address. Um, the ID is basically just a uh, shot to hash of the node public key, and this is what we're currently using right now to identify nodes within the network. Uh, so we have both nodes up right now, and you know, one thing I'll do real quick, I'll connect the nodes. So like that, both nodes are connected now, and um, right now as we can do list peers, 
and we see that we have a node, it's a light ID, and uh, you know, there's nothing else uh, really to report because we don't have a channel open with it yet. So to get around that, we can now open a channel. I'm gonna take off that block parameter, I actually had that on there before. But now we say, okay, we're gonna open up a channel of pair one, we have 100 million Satoshis or one Bitcoin, and we wanna wait exactly for one uh, confirmation before we consider the channel open. So there we go, the channel's open now, and uh, both sides are now currently waiting for the channel to, to finish, right? So um, one thing we can do here, uh, so basically we they went through an initial funding workflow where basically uh, this node right here, the demo one node, basically said, hey, I wanna open a channel with you, and then they uh, went through the workflow. Uh, currently in our uh, daemon, we only have single funding channels open, and this is just basically just for uh, initial simplicity of the of the implementation and the network itself, and also because if you want to do a dual funder channel where basically maybe we, we both put in uh, five Bitcoin each, then uh, you might require you know possibly like a little more trust because um, you know at that point you're working with some stranger and they have your money uh, tied up, and if they go away, then well you know you need to wait, you need to wait a week or so, so you can get in inconvenienced. Um, so uh, one thing here is on the left hand screen we have some logs. Uh, I'm running in verbose mode just so you guys can see you know all the logs that are actually there right now. And uh, initially you see we have the uh, funding request. You send it over, it gets a response, and this is basically just giving you parameters to open the channel, such as various keys we need, parameters like how long do we need to wait for the CSV delay, and uh, you know it goes through both sides. And then finally the uh, originating node broadcasts the transaction, right? So now at this point, both nodes are waiting for a single confirmation, and uh, we can give them that confirmation real quick by having BTCD generate a single block. So boom, the block has been generated now, and now uh, both sides are ready to, to rock, essentially. So if we come over to this guy, uh, the node who was connected to, and we do list peers, then we see you know we have a channel open with the other guy, that's one Bitcoin and they have all the money. And then if we go over to this guy, uh, again, we have uh, you know one Bitcoin channel with the other person and local balance is uh, one Bitcoin, so I have all the money, right? And uh, you know, so we see some log messages over here on the left-hand side. And uh, what they're doing here is they're filling up that initial re revocation window, right? And both sides basically just uh, fill this up by sending revocations. But these revocations have basically a nil pre-image, meaning they don't actually do anything. And these are just meant to populate the initial revocation window. So, uh, you know, one thing I want to show uh, here, I want to show, uh, you know, just kind of sending some payments and some of the APIs uh, between the RPC server and the client itself. So I have this little small Go, pro Go, Go program over here, right? And what this program does, it first creates a, um, a client, and then uh, creating that client basically is just connecting over local host to the, to the daemon itself. And uh, once we have this client, we basically have a stub of the uh, gRPC server itself. So using the stub, we can send payments around uh, as we want to, and we work with native objects in whichever language we're working in, right? So basically, um, one of the things gRPC has is it has bidirectional streams, and we're going to be using utilizing that here. So what the client does, it creates a stream initially, and a stream is basically just opens a new session between itself and the RPC server, and with the stream, it can then send and receive uh, you know, in a non-blocking manner across the stream, and the server can do the same also. So uh, we're just going to show basically here uh, like a burst of uh, HTLCs going across, or you know, some micropayments. So we want to send two thousand satoshis, right? But we're going to send uh, the two thousand. We're going to send two thousand satoshis one satoshi at a time, meaning we're going to complete uh, two thousand total payments. And the way the loop works here is basically just you know uh, keeps going. It's like a while loop essentially. Keeps it going until all the satoshis are sent. And then for each send attempt, it launches a new Go routine. And these are basically like lightweight threads in Go, and you can launch like a thousand of them. And uh, you know, there's really not much overhead. And they have a very small stack, and the runtime scheduler hand handles them uh, rather efficiently. So uh, you know, after each of the uh, payments have been completed, we're going to basically uh, push it down on the semaphore, and then print out the number. And then finally, at the end, I'll be printing out the elapsed time, and then kind of like a rough you know, TPS metrics, right? And then, so if we come over here to the server, this is basically the, the way the, uh, the, the, the server code is set up and the, and the path through it. So initially on the right here, we have the RPC server. And this is the method where it's handling the send payment command, right? And with that, it basically reads in from the client 
And once it, once it reads in from the client, it launches a new Go routine, and that Go routine sends the um, new payment request over to the HTLC switch, right? And then finally, respond back to the client once that's been completed. And then over here on the left, this is the switch itself. It gets the packet and then checks if it has the proper interface or not. And if it has the proper interface, then it finally goes through and attempts to, to send a payment out if it has sufficient capacity. So that's, that's the, how the demo is going to be. And we have right here a pre commod binary, so I can just hit enter and the demo will run. And as you see, we're done here. And uh, you know, we're scrolling a little bit on the left, but that's just um, uh, just these log messages because they uh, they take more time to actually like flush through the buffer. But it's actually done at this point. And you see, it took about well, you know, 1.8 seconds. We sent 2,000 uh, individual updates, and that ended up taking. And we did that in 1.8 seconds, so we have about you know 1,000 TPS. So that means you know, uh, with micropayments, we can just keep doing this. And uh, note that this is only on one channel in a single direction. So you can assume if we uh, do this bidirectionally, we can uh, you know increase increase the throughput by twofold, and per channel and per node and so on. Uh, this can really just, just scale out horizontally, and generally it's, it's only dependent on latency and then also the uh, hardware um, of the node itself. Uh, currently within the code, it's pretty much I/O bound, uh, just because we're doing using like a kind of an inefficient manner to record the states, but that can be improved uh, instead to be like an append only log, and uh, you know can make things much more efficient. So if we do list peers here, then we see that uh, you know the remote balance has has two hundred. I mean, sorry, two thousand, and we have now two thousand less than one Bitcoin, and we took thirteen updates, right? And this guy's already done over here because he had uh, less log messages as the receiver. But as you can see, finally it extends the local chain, and we see that this is the final commitment transaction here. And this commitment transaction has two thousand satoshis to us. You know, we have this delay output showing that it's a witness crypt hash. And then uh, you know the other side gets the rest, and they um, can you know spend their money immediately because this is our version of the commitment transaction. And okay, it's still set on over there, but uh, yeah. So that, that was like just a quick demo. And um, at, at, at this point, uh, some remaining steps to do with the commitment protocol LCP is I'm going to be looking into doing some form of verification in the form of TLA plus or plus cal which is a, a modeling framework created by Leslie Lamport used to um, you know, check the correctness of concurrent protocols. And because we've just created a concurrent protocol, we'd like to have some assurance as to exactly the qualities, you know, make sure that we have liveliness, meaning we uh, you know, don't result in, in deadlock throughout, and that we have safety that you know, will always end up at the same state, and, live, and, uh, you know, and things of that nature. And um, you know, if we wanted to like, send you know, another quick payment, we could do one. Okay, I'm sending it, you know, 100 Satoshis, and uh, that's finished now, right? So now finally, we'd like to close out the channel, right? So the way we close out the channel is we get the channel point. We get the channel point, and then now we're going to close out the channel, right? So we do close channel, funding, txid equals, oh, is it not letting me copy paste? All right, there it is, and then I'll put index is equal to zero. So just like that, now uh, this this side, the initiator, sends the closed channel request. The other guy then accepts it and broadcasts the channel. So as you can see here on the left-hand side, the, the channel has been broadcast. This is the witness uh, spending from the multisig, and we have our um, we have our two keys, and then we also have the redeem script itself. And uh, you know both sides get their money. This guy gets his uh, 2,100 uh, satoshis, and the other guy gets the remainder. And we pay basically a small fee. So now, finally, in order to close everything else out, we need to generate another block. So blocks been generated. Both sides have closed the channel, and then finally everything's good, right? So now, if we go back on this guy or either one of them, we do list peers. We see we still have a peer but uh, there aren't any more channels remaining, and both sides have now started their balances on the blockchain. So just to recap this demo, we basically brought up two nodes, we opened a channel between them, and we sent 2,000 Satoshis across as uh, you know, individual one Satoshi payments in the micropayment scenario. Uh, it took about a second or so, and we achieved around 1,000 uh, transactions per second, assuming uh, you know, each ACLC is an atomic transaction, and uh, there's about like 70 milliseconds of latency between them, but this is completely unoptimized at all, and this is kind of just showing a demo of uh, what we've been working on so far. Yeah, so that's the uh, end of the demo. Back to the presentation.
Thank you. Yeah, and uh, you know, you guys can pull down the repo, and that works now on testnet or simnet. But you know, obviously, I did uh, I'm testnet or segnet, but I did simnet here, just basically, you know, control block creation myself. All right. Uh, so now some things about routing, right? Uh, so like one issue we run into with Lightning is basically path authentication, right? If I'm in a network and any node can basically, you know, there's no curation, no one tells me this is the graph, any node can feed me basically an invalid, uh, you know, path, right? And you can imagine me as a node, I get isolated, and then someone gives, you know, feeds me this, uh, you know, parallel network that doesn't actually exist, and I say, oh, I'm going to route all my payments through this. I route all my payments, and they become stuck, and I, you know, just have to wait the entire time because there's an attacker. So to prevent this, we basically all authenticate all the path advertisements, right? So meaning, you know, when you tell me there's a path between Bob and Charlie, you also gave me a proof of that path, right? And the proof basically consists of two different things. Uh, the first part of the proof is an SPV proof of the funding transaction, meaning, you know, you treat me as a light client and you give me a proof showing, you know, that at some time uh, this output, uh, you know, this output was created in the blockchain. You show me sufficient work and I say, okay, this channel was there at some point. But then now I want to know that you actually control, you know, the two, um, you actually, you have, you have a connection in the network between these two peers, and those two peers actually know the private keys of the funding transaction, which is the 202 multi-sig. So to do this, we use an aggregate signature of the four pseudonyms, right? So if you can imagine if A1 and A2 are the two identities on the network, let's say they, you know, they have public keys for identities, and B1 and B2 are the channel public keys, meaning these are the public keys within the blockchain itself in the 202 multi-sig, uh, both sides, they add those two points together, their public keys, and they get C1 and C2. And then they take C1 and C2 and then they add that together itself. And you know, C2 is basically kind of like the group channel public key. And in order for us to link all four identities, what they do is they use, they, they generate a signature over you know, some details of the, of the transaction hash. And that signature is a group uh, signature using Ishi Snor, meaning rather than you know, doing like four individual signatures, we do one you know, single signature which authenticates uh, all the parties. And you know, you could do two signatures, but then that would basically allow, um, you know, to, that would allow multiple peers in the network to basically attest to a single channel. And that would give you basically like a non-canonical view of the network. But we want to say, you know, every single peer is connected only, you know, with, is peer-wise connected both in the network and within the blockchain itself. So, you know, if you send this to me, I'm like, okay, you know, I'll add this because you did some work, meaning you did work to, uh, you know, pay the transaction fees, try to create the channel, and you also did work in order to um, uh, actually, you know, lock up some, some amount of funds in the channel itself. And then uh, Flare. So, uh, you know, I collaborated with Bitfury on a paper, uh, we called it Flare. It was kind of like an initial approach to some things that we would like to see in terms of like routing within the network. Uh, so like Flare kind of borrows heavily from existing literature in like what they call like manets or like mobile ad hoc networks. And these basically, you know, these are mesh networks. Because the scenario in Lightning is very similar to a mesh network, meaning, you know, there's no central provider. No one gives around IP addresses. It should be self-configuring. Nodes may come and leave at any time because they're going offline or not. So we thought that we could basically learn a lot from, uh, you know, the literature in uh, routing protocols in Manets. And it's a hybrid routing protocol, meaning uh, it combines two phases, right? Typically, you have just proactive uh, routing, and then you, or you have reactive routing. And with proactive routing, typically, you basically, uh, you have like a link state or a, dis or a distance vector, meaning you collect all the information proactively, and then once you actually want to send, you have all the information, right? That comes at a cost, that comes at, a, you know, a storage cost, but then also that comes at a bandwidth cost to basically handle all the updates from everybody else. So then reactive uh, routing basically says, okay, you know, I won't keep the entire state, and when I actually want to send a payment, I may have to like consult the network, which basically adds latency into my, into my uh, connection establishment, and then if the network knows uh, my path, they send it back to me, and then I can actually uh, route and then send packets around. And this is reactive because uh, it, you know, at the point it actually wants to send, then does it actually go into the network. So uh, Flare is a hybrid routing protocol which combines these two approaches, right? So first there's a reactive state. And in the reactive state, you have, as a node, you have an initial kind of uh, neighborhood radius, right? And this is like maybe like, you know, five hops or four hops at max. And within this neighborhood radius, you basically, uh, you know, handle all the updates, essentially. You handle all the updates of people opening and closing channels, and you handle people opening and leaving. And because this is only like, you know, a subset of the entire network, you, you have savings in both bandwidth and storage. Because rather than worrying about, you know, like 100 million peers, I only worry about maybe, you know, this five in this distance, which is maybe like 100 or so, right? And then we have these things called beacons, right? And, uh, you know, beacons kind of borrow from Catamelia, where they add this, like, XOR distance, meaning, uh, you know, you might be a, a, a possible beacon candidate for myself if our address distance is close, right? And that address distance is basically, I have, you know, my address A and your address B, and we XOR those, right? And once we XOR those, if you're a possible beacon, then I will, uh, you know, add you to my table, and I'll, you know, get your other routes uh, from, uh, I'll get your routes from you. 
And uh, you know, each, uh, these are parameters, the neighborhood size, and also like the number of beacons. And what happens initially is you, know, you connect to the network, you have your initial neighborhood size, and then from there you do the beacon search, right? So you can solve you know, all your current neighbors, like you know, who is close to me, such that I can you know, get a better view of the network, essentially. And because of the way the addresses are generated via hash function, and then also the XOR, this basically allows me to get you know, some random feeler connection down to the network. So I basically have a very, very you know, well illuminated view of the like, neighborhood, and then also, uh, in addition, I have kind of some feeler connections out into the network, which are farther away and you know, randomly distributed. And uh, you know, this basically resembles a fog of war, where I initially have a very good view of my local, and then uh, beyond that, it's a little more froggy. Uh, and then we have a uh, reactive uh, uh, aspect of it. So reactive comes out when I actually want to send a payment itself, right? And uh, because uh, this is lightning, and we imagine that maybe like, you know, fee updates are very, very fast, we could, we could flood all those updates and all the fee schedules, but that may, be, you know, that may consume a large amount of bandwidth, and they may change very rapidly. So instead, we uh, know our candidate paths, and we basically establish a, a, like a hornet onion circuit through this candidate path. And then as we're establishing the circuit with each uh, node within the path, we collect additional payment information, and this payment information is in the form of fees. So uh, you know, initially I have, this, uh, route, I have this path discovery, and then I have you know, onion circuits every single one of the candidate routes. I pick the one, maybe, uh, maybe I pick two for redundancy, one that has the least amount of fees, and then I can, I can actually use that route to send payments and exchange possible uh, additional hashes between me and the other person. But in the case that, you know, let's say the, uh, my beacons were insufficient, meaning with my uh, local neighborhood and my beacons, I wasn't able to find a proper path. What I can do now is I know, you know your address, and I can use the beacons to basically um, do like a DFS search using these, this address distance, and then eventually get to you, right? So uh, this is uh, it's similar to basically like an iterated um, you know, like DHT lookup rather than a recursive one. And using this, I will be able to find a path of high probability. Uh, you know, there's a drawback, meaning that we don't get optimal routing distance because um, we're using this like probabilistic structure and we may basically you know, do some unnecessary hops on the way. But what this allows us to do is it allows us to basically only have a very, very small amount of client state, yet still, reach, uh, yet still be able to route with high probability. Uh, you know, so like initially we won't you know, be implementing uh, all of Fleur or maybe in, in it full at all because some of the optimizations are unnecessary you know, in the initial stage, right? Maybe we have like a thousand nodes and that's good for us, right? Flare is kind of if you have like you know, hundreds of millions and you don't want to store all the information. But if you only have a thousand nodes and every node has maybe like 10 channels or so, that's not much state, right? And everyone can just kind of keep that state initially and we use channel proofs, again, uh, you know, in order to authenticate all the past itself. And uh, because we have the global state and we have all the information, we can, retreat, we can uh, you know, achieve the optimal path length and find a node in uh, you know, optimal time. And uh, yeah, so by the way, I work with Lightning Labs and we're also hiring you know, in, uh, to add to our team. We're hiring you know, engineers, front engineers, systems engineers, protocol engineers, and you can find our code, uh, the daemon, which I showed, uh, Lightning Network slash LND, and some of the underrouting code I mentioned, which is Hornet and Sphinx, to add privacy to the network at Lightning Onion. And yeah, thank you.